Hi everyone, today I want to talk to you about analogical induction. As you recall, inductive arguments are those that if the premises are true, the conclusion has been supported. Last week we studied enumerative induction. Those types of arguments draw a sample or cases, and then we try to generalize to the target population. This week, we'll learn about analogical induction. An argument making use of analogy. Analogies are comparing and contrasting two things. And you're reasoning that because two or more things are similar in several respects, they must be similar in some further respect. The logic of analogical arguments or analogical inductions are as follows. Thing A has properties P1, P2, P3, plus the property P4. Thing B that you're comparing and contrasting has properties P1, P2, and P3. Therefore, based on the comparison or analogy between the two, thing B probably has property P4. So let's consider an example. Humans can move about solve mathematical equations, win chess games, and feel pain. Robots are like humans in that they can also move about, solve mathematical equations, and win chess games. Therefore, it is probable that robots can also feel pain. Now, in order to analyze this um, analogical induction argument, what you want to do is first read it, understand it, and then we want to uh, Identify the conclusion and the premises, and then put it in put the premises and the conclusion in a standard format, and then we'll kind of go, uh, you know, analyze it. All right. So the conclusion of this argument is um, is this sentence, right? Uh, Therefore, is a conclusion indicator, and what comes before that, those two sentences up here, humans can move about. Robots are, right? These are uh, the premises. So based on our analysis so far, we might say this. Premise one, humans can move about, solve mathematical equations, win chess games, and feel pain. Premise one. Robots uh, can also move about, solve mathematical equations, and win chess games. Premise two. In the conclusion, it is probable that robots can also feel pain. Now, two things that, that are being compared in this example. Thing one, humans, right? And then humans have these four characteristics or properties. They can move about, solve math problems, win chess games, and feel pain. And there are four properties that, attribute, that are attributed to humans. Now robots, thing two, are like humans in that they can also move about. That's thing um, property one, solve mathematical equations, property two, and win chess games, property three. Now what the argument asserts is that based on the analogy between humans and robots, we can probably conclude that robots can also feel pain. So here's the question. Uh, based on those similarities, can we reasonably conclude that robots can also feel pain? What do you think? Now, based on the example that we have just considered, you might say, well, well I mean, it is true that both humans and robots can move about, right? They're kind of locomotive, right? And then it is also true that they can also, you know, both solve mathematical equations. And robots or AIs can probably solve math problems faster and more accurately than a lot of humans can. And, um, and you know, both robots and humans can win chess games. Um, you know, we can make the argument that maybe robots can do better than humans in playing chess. However, based on those things, and we can say that there are, there are a number of relevant similarities between humans and robots. 
But you might kind of think, well, you know what? Actually, they are similar in certain respects, but they're different in other respects. For one, humans are like biological organisms uh, with the central nervous system that allows us to feel pain. But robots, they're not biological uh, organisms. They're maybe synthetic material. Um, and so it's kind of questionable how they would feel pain. So, in other words, there is a relevant dissimilarity, kind of contrast between two things, right? So what that tells us is that in order to judge or evaluate analogical inductions, you have to first look at the number of relevant similarities between two things that you're comparing. Secondly, you have to look at the number of relevant dissimilarities between the two things that you are comparing. And furthermore, you, know, you want to look at the number of instances being compared. All things equal, the more instances be, that are being compared, the stronger the argument. And finally, the diversity among cases. The more diverse uh, of the cases that you consider, the stronger the argument, generally speaking. Analogical inductions are useful in the sciences, um, useful in the law, and useful in, in religion, making arguments about religion, um, as well as in the kind of everyday context. Uh, the chapter five of the textbook gives uh, several examples coming from medical science, the law, forensic science, and religion. And I wanted to just kind of illustrate by uh, giving you, uh, giving a couple of examples a first um, argument comes from medical science. Now, I want you to pause the video and read uh, the passage in front of you. And, and think about, you know, what is the conclusion? What are the premises? What are the two things that are being compared? Um, um, and then um, the properties that are attributed to each thing. So now, so now that you've done uh, the exercise by yourself, um, let's go over the example again. The conclusion of that argument is that humans will also experience a reduction in blood cholesterol when given the new, new drug. And then the conclusion is drawn based on an analogy drawn between two things, mice on the one hand and humans. Uh, so we're told that mice are mammals, have a circulatory system, have typical mammalian reactions, respond readily to high blood pressure drugs, and experience a reduction in blood cholesterol when given this new drug. So you can see that there are uh, five different properties. Mice are mammals. They have a mammalian circulatory system have typical mammalian biochemical reactions, they respond to, um, to high blood pressure drugs and experience a reduction in blood cholesterol when given that drug. So there are five things. In the second premise, we're told that humans are also mammals and thus we have a mammalian circulatory system, uh, have typical mammalian biochemical reactions to different things, and respond readily to high blood pressure drugs. And therefore, based on the comparison uh, between mice and humans, humans will also experience a reduction in blood cholesterol when given the new drug Z. Now, so, um, so now we want to ask whether this argument is strong or weak. And in order to do so, we have to apply the criteria that I covered a couple of slides ago. Uh, we want to see uh, the number of, um, of uh, relevant similarities between mice and humans. And we will also want to examine the relevant dissimilarities between mice and humans. And here you want to ask, are there sort of relevant dissimilarity uh, there's the similarities between mice and humans that would allow us to think that humans will not experience a reduction in blood cholesterol when given the drug. And then 
Uh, we also want to look at the number of instances that are being compared, and then finally the diversity of cases. Analogical induction can be useful in thinking about religion. In philosophy, there is a branch of philosophy called the philosophy of religion, in which we rationally investigate uh, the existence of God, uh, some of the problems in thinking that God exists, the rational nature of religious beliefs, and, and things of that sort. And philosophers are and have been concerned with uh, whether God exists or not. And there are and have you know been have um, you know philosophers have suggested many different arguments, but here's a, an argument that is quite famous that was first devised by this theologian and uh, philosopher named William Paley, and it's called teleological argument. And the word teleology or telos means purpose or ends. And here's the argument: a watch is a mechanism of exquisite complexity with numerous parts precisely arranged and accurately adjusted to achieve a purpose, a purpose imposed by the watch's designer. Likewise, the universe has exquisite complexity with countless parts, from atoms to asteroids, that fit together precisely and accurately to produce certain effects as though arranged by plan. Therefore, the universe must have a designer. So here you want to read it, understand it, identify the conclusion, identify the premises, and then see what are the two things that are being compared and what are the properties that are attributed to each thing. So let's um, state the teleological argument in a standard format. Uh, premise one states uh, about a watch, uh, that's the thing one, and then there are two properties. Uh, one is the mechanism of exquisite complexity with numerous parts working together. And then uh, the second part is achieving a purpose. And, um, and if you look at a, a watch uh, and you look inside of it, uh, they're usually very complex and numerous parts really work together for the purposes of telling time. And we can infer from that that there's got to be a watch's designer you know, that has designed the watch. And then uh, the argument makes an analogy in the second premise with the universe. And we can, um, the universe also has exquisite complexity with countless parts from atoms to asteroids that fit together precisely and accurately. Um, and, you know, physicists and scientists um, tell us that the universe is an incredibly complex place. And then the, the very existence of the Earth in its hospitable environment um, is, uh, is something that we all marvel at. And, um, and so that's the so thing uh, two is the universe and then the exquisite complexity with countless parts. That's kind of property one. And based on the analogy or the comparisons between the two, we can conclude that the universe also, must also have a designer. Um, 